Welcome back. I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to present a recorded webinar from one year ago for my Patreon members. This one's on load calculations for zoned systems. It's out of ACA Manual ZR, particularly Section 4. Without further ado, here's the training. Now I'm going to give you an overview and talk about survey, particularly the things during site survey that impact these load calcs you're going to do for zone systems. I'm briefly going to touch on sizing systems using the heating and cooling loads. Then we're going to dive into zoning compatibility, which will include directional, time of day, and of course exposure when we talk about zoning. We'll hit on compromised zones and of course what you do with corner rooms, some very basics about locating thermostats, what to do for setback or setup, and of course which software and pieces you need to use when doing a load calc for zoning. By now, you should know the difference between a block load and a room by room load calculation. When you're sizing with heating loads, you can use a block load. That's because the glass isn't gonna impact the heat loss of the building, just the heat gain. But when you're sizing systems with just the cooling loads, which is what you need to look at when you're zoning a system out, of course the glass is going to impact this and you really should do a room by room or zone by zone load calculation one of the biggest pieces you need to use software for is what's called the aed curve or adequate exposure diversity the aed graph will actually show you when you have peak solar gain and typically you're going to keep that line below the 130 percent mark if the AED curve spikes above the 130% mark, this is an indication that you need to zone the home in order for that zone to be comfortable at said time of day. Now, there can be multiple peaks. As you can see in this example, this is what you normally see with normal adequate exposure, but just a little bit more glass on the south or southwest portion of the house because this peak goes above 130% once we reach 4 or 5 p.m. This is normal for the Northeast. Now keep in mind, this could change when we talk about October cooling as well. This is for normal July cooling. Now, when it comes to the pieces of site survey that's really important for applying load calcs to zone systems, you have to spend a lot of time on fenestration. Fenestration is what's gonna actually contribute most to these uncomfortable rooms or compromised zones. So when you're doing the site survey, you need to spend a lot of time on the glass, which direction it faces, shading, meaning internal shades, and of course overhangs, all of the efficient construction features you need to have in your load calc to get the correct AED graph and sensible gains from those windows. Remember, for overhangs, you wanna measure the height above the window to the overhang and then how far in feet the overhang hangs over that window. If it's not a two to one ratio or more, then it's not going to provide shading. As you can see in this picture here, there's a huge porch on, my, on the front side of my house. This has a way more than a two to one ratio. We measure the feet above the window to the porch roof and how far the porch hangs over in order to provide shading. Juxtapose this other picture, which is my daughter's bedroom, taken at noon, you can see that little bit of soffit hanging over is not providing shading. It does not have a two to one or more ratio above the window to the overhang. Therefore, we don't include that in the load calculation. Now, when we're zoning out the system, some logical things make sense, right? So if we have an open floor plan, that's gonna be really easy to zone or the areas that are open to each other. If we have a lot of isolated rooms, we have to be very careful in zoning these rooms together. We can't just zone them because they're next to each other because they might have opposite directional compatibility or in other words, fenestration that faces other directions that are not compatible together. We wouldn't want to, let's say, zone a room that has east facing glass only with a room that has west facing glass only because in the morning we're gonna overcool the west side of the house and then in the afternoon, we're gonna drastically overcool the east side of the house. Keep in mind design temperatures and comfort is what we're really selling to homeowners. So if we provide zoning, we need to make sure we understand their expectations when it comes to heating and cooling that space. And this is 
really where you start to identify zones that are required by the homeowner and if they're compatible with other rooms in the house. Ideally, we're just gonna follow the code when it comes to setting expectations for inside design temperatures, right? So 75 degrees dry bulb and 50% relative humidity and cooling is what the International Residential Code and the IECC states. That's what you should be designing around. Of course, 70 degrees in heating plus or minus two. And these fall into the comfort zone. Now, just because the majority of people are comfortable here does not mean the homeowner that you're requesting this information from thinks they should cool their house to 75. You need to set that expectation. We can't make it a meat locker, but if you need to have it dry and you need to make sure it doesn't drift from your set point, then maybe you need to start to zone those spaces based on the homeowner's expectations. A single zone system may just not cut it. Now, we talked about the set points, but what is allowed when it comes to drift or variance from the thermostat? Normally, most people in the heating season are actually comfortable if the temperature does not stray more than plus or minus two degrees from the thermostat. In cooling, you're actually allowed a little bit more if you're removing moisture because it still feels comfortable, plus or minus three degrees from the thermostat. And usually we're locating that thermostat in a central location where the return is, so it could easily drift when you have a lot of outward facing rooms that face south or southwest with a lot of glass. Now, of course, that three degrees is an average. The maximum really is six degrees. Anything more than that, even if it's dry in the space, you're gonna feel room to room variances as a person. And when that happens, the homeowner's gonna feel like the system's not operating up to speed and they're not comfortable in those other rooms. That is one way to look at when you're doing a site survey, do I need to zone those areas if you're replacing an existing system? A lot of times they'll use supplemental heating or cooling in those zones as well. And that's a great indication you need to actually zone that room. This becomes even tougher when you talk about floor to floor. If you're trying to do one system for a multi-story home, there is a maximum temperature difference allowed across floors when you're designing this for comfort, which is ACA manual RS, right? The maximum between floors is also six degrees. And this is very easy to do in a Cape style home when you don't have enough return air upstairs for a basement system, let's say. So zoning out those rooms by floor is also a common method, but remember to still look at exposure. So in this example, Think about what the changes across these rooms would be if you have a single zone, just constant volume system. That thermostat is located in the center of the house. Of course, we're gonna have varying degrees, no pun intended, of temperature differences across those rooms, particularly for those rooms that face south and west in the afternoon. We would identify this using that AED or adequate exposure diversity curve and if we have a curve for every room, if your software does that, then we're actually able to match up the correct rooms together for zoning. Now, a lot of times it's common sense, like we talked about before, with a central AC system and zoning based on the living spaces, right? So in this example, you can see all of the bedrooms are zoned together because they also have uh, similar facing glass versus the open floor area where the living room and the kitchen and, and those types of areas are. So this is very common sense as far as zoning goes, but when things get more chopped up or more complex or more levels, we have to make sure we look at the glass. By zoning this way, there's still gonna be very little temperature difference across those zones. Just be careful, especially if you're doing ductless systems, you don't start mixing these living areas because it's easy to overheat and overcool those areas if it's on a multi-zone system. Now, taking a look at this spike on the AET curve, there's a couple things to keep in mind. If it's a very small spike, just barely goes above the 130% threshold, it's probably okay to do a central system. You're not gonna have a huge demand problem and you may just get more comfort by just moving the thermostat over to that zone that has the peak glass. Unless you have multiple rooms that face opposite directions, then moving the thermostat isn't gonna help one or the other, right? If you have a substantial peak, you really need to use staged or variable speed systems in order to meet these demands. Unless those peaks are the same room or the rooms face the same direction, then locating the thermostat in that room would accomplish the same thing. Now let's talk about directional compatibility. That means the rooms face the same direction and the glass faces the same direction. 
and it's really easy to know that these rooms would go together. Of course, the number one thing is they are operating in the same mode. If you have a situation where an area of the home needs to operate in heating while the rest is operating in cooling, of course you need to zone with equipment and have separate systems, unless you have a VRF system that's capable of both. Of course, using that AED curve, the peak for cooling needs to be during the same time and of course on the same month because the sun does change where it comes up and sets when we're talking about July versus October. Now, what about time of day zoning? We need to look at hourly glass loads. That means the AED curve needs to be provided for each zone or room that you have. Some software is capable of this, some of it's not. Also, keep in mind, this doesn't include the hourly room loads. If you have a lot of internal gains that changes throughout the day, as an example, lighting in a kitchen and you're not using it all day, but it spikes in the afternoon, that does not show up on an AED curve. That's not under exposure, that's internal gains. So that is a limitation of software that doesn't provide a combined curve for you. This is a great picture and example of why you should zone by exposure if you have a house that has glass facing drastic east or west. This is even more important if one of those directions faces water because you get a lot of directional reflection off of that water and it picks up a much higher load than it would if it was, I don't know, crushed rock or grass out there. This is really important in your site survey to make sure you mark what's in the foreground of those windows in that house. Now, if you have a room that has glass facing multiple directions, as an example, the kitchen in my house, you can see on the left-hand side of this floor plan, I have glass that faces east and south. So this would be what we call a compromise zone. You usually have no problem combining this with rooms that have north facing glass for obvious reasons. There's not gonna be a spike typically in that room and we can cover it by putting the thermostat in the compromise zone. Some of the best combinations really have to go around with skylights. These are what actually impact the load the most. Uh, you know, horizontal or 45 degree angle glass that is uh, not gonna pick up the same load as just a flat window, much higher loads. So it's very important when you have skylights that you combine them with certain areas. As an example, skylights go well with northeast, east or southeast facing glass. That's pretty easy. You may wanna combine them with southwest, west or northwest facing glass as well. Those combine very well if you have that same room that has those southwest, west or northwest facing glass. Now you kind of want to stay away from combining them with southeast or south facing glass unless it's in the same room. This is where we start to get a little bit more compromised here. The same for southwest and south glass. Now just above that in the same home, my house, is my daughter's room and bathroom. And you can see here we have the same issue with south and east facing glass. This is a, cor a corner room. What you need to remember is the sum of all of the glass facing south and the, plus the sum of all of the glass facing east does not equal what it would face southeast. It's really important to remember this. There's no shortcuts here. You have to put it correctly into the load calc in order to get a combined sensible gain for the room. Now, if we have some of those compromised zones, the thermostat should really be located in the one with the highest load, right? That's what you would think. You really should take a look at the loads and do the math. There's actually an equation in ACA Manual ZR for zoning to find out which zone provides the least temperature difference when we locate the thermostat in there. Usually, you want to put that thermostat in the room with the largest glass load. Keep in mind, we're not looking at internal gains, so it's not the largest load. Now, when you select equipment for air conditioning, you could, for a zone system, be as low as 90% of the load, and you ask, how or why would I do that? And that's what's in the manual S as far as the guidance goes. And usually people do this with zone systems, and they do this because the house is not always maintained at the same temperature if you have a large home that's zoned with, let's say, ductless or even a zoned system for ductwork. What you need to do in order to find out if you're able to undersize a system because some of that area is going to be in setback or set up, keep in mind this should always be authorized by the homeowner because you want to make sure that they know it's not going to be the same temperature over there. You need to do a block load on area number one at your design temperatures 
and then do a block load on area number two at your setback temperatures. That's the first load calc you do. Then you would do the same thing opposite, where you do a block load on area number one at your setback temperatures, and then on area number two at your actual design temperatures. And when you combine the two of these, example number one versus example number two, the highest of the two load calcs is what you would do and use to size your system. I know this sounds odd, but that's how you do it when you have setback or set up. Now this is very common in commercial applications, not so much in residential, but we're seeing it more often, particularly with much lower loads. If the homeowner is co comfortable with undersizing a system to be more efficient, remove more moisture because they know they're gonna have an area of the home that's using setback during a certain time of day, let's say bedrooms for the majority of the day, then it's really easy to put a smaller system in and use less electricity and be more comfortable. When selecting load calc software for zoning, there are a few key features you need to look at. Number one, it needs to provide an AED graph, at least for the block load. That's very important. If you're installing a zone system, hopefully you can get that AED graph for each zone. If not, this may require multiple load calculations in your software in order to provide that. As you can see in this particular AED graph, there's a lot of glass that's facing south. If I wanted to then zone this system out with this particular load calc software, I have to go back and do a load calc for each separate zone in order to provide that to make sure that that room is compatible with the other rooms. Hopefully that makes sense. So just to recap, we talked about AED excursion and how to know when you need to zone a system. We talked about zone compatibility. Remember, it's not just the biggest or the ones that face south. They need to be compatible either directionally, time of day, by floor. There's other ways to zone a system out. We talked about compromise zones and corner rooms and how to handle those. And if you're not sure about zoning and you don't know what to do next, take a look at a video that I prepared for our Patreon members, you guys, about a year ago. It's on section three in ACA Manual ZR. It's called Making Zoning Decisions. Highly recommend you take a look at that before you go forward and start zoning out the next house. So as you heard, we discussed sizing systems, zoning compatibility, compromise zones and corner rooms, thermostats, setback, and even software. What'd you think? Did you like the training? If you like this and you want to get it one year in advance, head over to my Patreon page where you can join for just as little as $8 a month and get access to a whole year's worth in advance. Thanks for joining me this week at HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.